<laughs> okay, um, welcome everyone. And thank you for coming to the, uh, the last in a series of three lunch hour sessions that will allow this year's Logue Fellow to introduce themselves to the GSD community. My name is Mark Mulligan. I'm an associate professor in practice of architecture here at the GSD. And currently I'm the interim curator for the Logue Fellowship in 2014-15. Uh, my predecessor is in the back of the room, Jim Stocker, the former curator of Low Fellowship. And I also want to give a shout out to Sally Young in the front row, who is the uh, Low Fellowship coordinator, my partner and mentor in learning the ropes of this challenging and incredibly rewarding uh, job that I have the honor to do this year. So, um, also I want to thank everyone involved, especially Sally, for setting up uh, last night's uh, reception in Piper. We had amazing attendance, and um, I just eavesdropped on a lot of really interesting conversations. I'm still getting uh, caught up with uh, the current fellows about people they've met or who they've, what they've talked about, new ideas, new projects, possibly on the way. Uh, so that was, that was wonderful, and you know, I think the attendance and the interest really speaks volumes about the role that the Loeb Fellowship plays in this school. So. Very, very positive. Uh, so today, in the interest of time, since we have four speakers rather than three on our previous days, uh, I'm going to keep my introductory remarks uh, briefer than before. You're already familiar with the fellowship and its mission, which is to bring accomplished mid-career professionals to the GSD uh, for a year of interaction, debate, reflection, and preparation for future leadership roles. Uh, the Loeb Fellows are a tremendous resource to us at the GSD, and I challenge everyone here to make the most of your opportunity to interact with them this year. That could be as easy as inviting a fellow to coffee to talk about your thesis research or your idea for independent study, a competition you're working on. It could also be a, a matter of inviting, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, asking your thesis, uh, excuse me, your studio critic to invite a fellow to give a talk relative to the subject of your studio, or possibly to come and join a review. So um, I'm speaking really mainly to the students here. It's your initiative that will make a difference for you and for the fellows this year. So keep that in mind. Now on to our speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce them as a group so that they can present one after the other without further interruption. Uh, this will also leave some time at the end for uh, Q&A. <coughs> We've grouped the talks this year uh, into three themes related to commonalities we perceive between their work. Uh, today's speakers are grouped under the theme Community Power and Leadership. True to the mission of the Loeb Fellowship, each of these fellows has devoted him or herself to serving the public good, not in an abstract, theoretical <coughs> sort of way, but through direct engagement with communities, entering, to, entering into sometimes difficult conversations and discovering difficult realities, and always looking for solutions where thoughtful design can play a role. In preparation for today's introductions, as I reread statements and CVs from this group, the word community popped up again and again. I'll leave it to the audience uh, to sense how those other keywords, power and leadership, characterize this remarkable group. Our first speaker will be Mark Norman. Mark has a background in real estate development and mortgage banking. He's dedicated his career to fighting inequality and to promoting economic development and social justice. He has done this by pairing innovative financial strategies with community development and design. At the Syracuse University School of Architecture, Mark teaches students and practitioners to deploy their design skills and to secure financing in service of meaningful social goals. As director of Upstate, a center for design research and real estate, he has pioneered and promoted mechanisms that reduce the cost of housing, expand access to education and employment opportunities, and promote good community health. He has orchestrated collaborations among architects and housing and transportation experts to capture the best practices from multiple fields that, in, that support integrated neighborhoods. In downtown Syracuse, his advocacy helped shift the public debate on Interstate 81 <coughs> from expanding an already obsolete highway to repairing the urban fabric it had compromised. He demonstrated how applying ecological design to managing stormwater can also invigorate a neighborhood and how meeting the needs of prison re-entry populations can be good for an entire community. During his fellowship year, Mark will survey existing best practices in finance and design and synthesize the most promising attributes of these to create a design innovation fund to promote smart, holistic approaches to creating a more equitable city. He's looking forward to, uh, he's looking to engage <coughs> experts in architecture, planning, and development in workshops and design charrettes over the course of the year. I know he'll welcome the involvement of many people here. 
Our second speaker will be Jamie Blosser, an architect from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Jamie has long been interested in forms of communal resiliency and how design influences that resiliency for better or worse. Living and working in the American Southwest, uh, she has become increasingly aware of problems facing Native American communities and how rarely those communities are involved in the critical decisions that directly affect them, including their own built and natural environments. A recipient of a Rose Fellowship in 2000, Jamie took the opportunity to engage the Native community of O.K. Owinge in New Mexico and to develop a community building process that incorporated traditional storytelling. This process led to the creation of a housing project modeled on the tribe's architectural and cultural heritage. Since that time, her built work, research, and advocacy in collaboration with 18 tribes throughout the Western United States has helped to remove barriers to self-determination and sovereignty and garnered many awards, including the 2013 HUD Secretary's Opportunity and Empowerment Award. In 2009, Jamie founded the Sustainable Native Communities Collaborative, SNCC for short, an initiative of enterprise community partners. Its mission is to develop and adapt green building tools for rural settings and to make these more accessible to tribes. SNCC has since developed 17 case studies on exemplary tribal housing projects, together highlighting an exciting paradigm shift in tribal housing, namely a return to place-based, self-determined, and culturally resilient design. These examples were showcased in DC last year at the National Museum of the American Indian. Jamie will use her fellowship year to develop a cohesive framework for her practice through research on sustainable <laughs> community development models and resilient planning principles in other marginalized communities around the world. Jamie will be followed by LaShawn Hoffman, a community activist and leader based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, LaShawn serves as CEO of the Pittsburgh Community Improvement Association, and that's Pittsburgh as in the Pittsburgh District of Atlanta. I save you the trouble of explaining that. Um, but I will let you explain a little bit more how that name came to be. Um, he is also the chair of the board for the Atlanta Housing Association's neighborhood-based developers. In both of these roles, LaShawn has spearheaded a wide range of programs focused on community improvement. In a state that has no public policy to ensure equitable availability of affordable housing, he has stepped up to facilitate the community-based planning process necessary to achieve sound conservation and growth strategies. He has navigated some of the most extreme fallout from the recent recession and foreclosure crisis to protect vulnerable homeowners. His advocacy on behalf of housing development, social services, and civic engagement has promoted neighborhood preservation and socioeconomic and cultural diversity. In 2006, LaShawn and PCIA partnered with the Georgia Conservancy to create a community plan addressing transportation, land use, and economic growth with consideration for history, culture, and natural <coughs> environment. Last year, with funding from the HUD Neighborhood Stabilization Program, PCIA rehabilitated 14 houses to a high standard of quality and energy efficiency, increasing housing options and improving the safety and appearance of the community. LaShawn will use his fellowship year to increase and hone his understanding of community and economic development with particular focus on the issues, opportunities, and key players in his region, which is the American South. He will explore how critical leadership tools such as consensus building and team building can lead to good public policy. And last but not least, our final speaker will be Gisler Martin uh, Balderson, who comes to us from Reykjavik, Iceland. As far as we can tell, Gisli is the first television talk show host to be selected as a Loeb Fellow. <laughs> we asked Oprah to reapply next year. <laughs> in addition to his work in radio and television, just seeing whether you're still with me, folks. Uh, in addition to his radio and television uh, work, Gisli Martin has served uh, as city councilor in Reykjavik <coughs> for over a decade and has been a key figure in putting sustainable urban planning on the political agenda in the city and across Iceland. Concerned with the increasing urban sprawl and related problems of air and water pollution, traffic congestion, and public health issues, he has devoted himself to the improvement of his city by writing, speaking, and building consensus for redensification and smart growth. As, chair, as chairman of the Committee for Environment and Transport, Gisli introduced the Green Steps for Reykjavik plan, which outlines measures for improving recycling and public transportation systems for creating bicycle-friendly streets and other actions. Despite a contentious political environment during his time on the council, all political parties endorsed his bicycle master plan, which has contributed to a tenfold increase in bicycle commuting over the past decade. Easley is very interested in, how the, in the democratic process of city planning, and during his fellowship year, he will study how to mobilize grassroots organizations 
and builds public support for difficult or controversial projects that achieve greater equity. He's seeking technical and theoretical expertise that will make him a more effective uh, communicator about urban issues and innovative design solutions. Those are my introductions. Uh, I will now hand off to Mark Norman. Thank you. I also I want to thank um, Sally and Mark for easing <coughs> us into this fellowship uh, very well with receptions, I think, every single night that we've been here. So, um, so uh, I think I'll go through this relatively quickly, but um, my history uh, is relatively varied. Um, I started at Skid Row Housing Trust uh, after getting my planning degree from UCLA School of Architecture and Urban Planning and then moved to New York doing um, finance in the service of affordable housing and community development. Um, and I think what's interesting about this chart is that all of, every boss I've had um, was either an architect or an urban planner. <laughs> One wouldn't think in some of these um, logos and some of these organizations that don't exist anymore. Um, <laughs> that wasn't my fault, by the way. <laughs> I that. Um, so at Skid Row Housing Trust, uh, the goal was really to take a one square mile neighborhood in Los Angeles um, and take the 60 single room occupancy hotels out of the hands of slumlords and create affordable supportive housing for uh, formerly homeless individuals, many of whom were dual diagnosed. Um, and uh, a number of projects got done. Uh, what was interesting about the Skid Row Housing Trust projects were that they uh, really enlisted architects um, in collaboration with us in the projects. Um, a lot of adaptive reuse. This was a, a former SRO that we converted um, to 99 units of single room occupancy housing, but also artist lofts for burgeoning arts population and ground floor retail, which was mostly light manufacturing. Um, architects such as Koenig Eisenberg um, also designed ground up buildings in Skid Row, and they've since done many, many projects, um, many of which you'll know. Um, this is after my time, but now Michael Maltzen has done a number of projects for them uh, in downtown, um, including uh, the Carver and the uh, Star Apartments here that's just completing construction. So you can see that really using architecture and thinking about the ways people circulate and people move was very important. Um, it's all, that's all still Skid Row. That's all still Skid Row. This is not. Um, so moving on to a consulting firm, Deverne and Brooks, we really helped cities master plan, um, do their HOPE 6 projects, so public housing revitalizations, and also do mixed income, mixed finance developments. We would help cities basically create uh, opportunities for their vacant land. Um, so that really nationalized uh, the work I was doing, uh, moving out of Los Angeles and New York projects and really doing things in Birmingham, uh, the Gulf Coast, um, before and after Katrina. Um, unfortunately, that had to be rebuilt after Katrina. Um, and uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore, over 10 cities uh, in the US is where we worked. Um, we also, at Deverne and Brooks, were developers doing mixed income, mixed use housing. So this is a project in Harlem on 149th Street called the Ellington, which was a cooperative uh, that had 23 units of affordable home ownership as well. Um, so on to Deutsche Bank, uh, what was really interesting here was one, that they were doing this kind of work, um, but two, that we really took a holistic approach uh, to the work we were doing. We were funding uh, the organizations that built uh, affordable housing, funded social enterprises, did triple bottom line investment, that's economic, social, and environmental, um, and also uh, created funds for this work to to further itself. So in Haiti, after the earthquake, we didn't build the housing, but we dealt with the mortgage markets in Haiti that weren't lending to lower income people um, and created a mortgage product uh, where we would take a first loss so that the banks would go in and start lending to people that they wouldn't normally lend to. Um, and then a, a lot of affordable housing, free development loans and construction loans, um, tax exempt bonds, uh, and then partnering with other people like the Cooper Hewitt on their design for the other 90%, so creating a fund for the organizations that uh, did projects. If you know that, that um, <coughs> exhibition 
There are about 60 innovative projects from all over the world. So we were trying to figure out ways to scale up uh, those projects uh, from typically very low uh, wealth nations that had really innovative ideas, like this community cooker uh, in Kenya. And then for the city of New York, working on things like the Clean Heat Fund, which was to help buildings switch from dirty oil to natural gas or geothermal or other cleaner energies. Um, so at Upstate, I felt like I was able to bring those histories, uh, that work experience, uh, in a way that I could bring all those things together and also be closer to the actual design aspects of it. Um, so our goals were new partnerships, uh, creative linkages, and for me, what was most important was replicable <coughs> models, um, legacy cities. Uh, as you know, Syracuse has uh, definitely seen better days, although things are really picking up there in terms of uh, economic development. Um, but also early interventions. So having lending and investing as part of the design process really lets the architects and urban planners in much earlier. Um, so we would really initiate projects which would then uh, go on to be designed. Um, so a number of those projects um, are still about to be built, but one of the things I think was great about uh, Upstate is we tried to prototype as much as possible. So this is a project we are doing with Stoss, Chris Reed, who uh, teaches here in landscape architecture. Um, we were trying to reimagine a way to create a healthy street, a play street, and also mitigate uh, stormwater. Um, so the money is already there for mitigating the stormwater. The city's under a consent decree. But how can we use that money to actually create better outcomes in the neighborhood? Um, so we did a demonstration. Um, as a way to show the city and the neighborhood uh, how we could actually get um, this done and how it would do all of those three things, the mitigation of the stormwater, but also getting people to move and play and uh, really utilize the street. Um, and then on the subject of I-81, uh, it cuts through town, kind of a typical story, destroyed the uh, historically Jewish and African-American neighborhood, 3,000 buildings gone, and now it's reached the end of its useful life. Um, the status quo is basically let's rebuild it, um, but it really creates a gash in the city. So uh, Rand Design Charettes uh, incorporated them with real estate seminars. So the architects um, that were taking real estate and also studio came together to produce not only designs for what it could be, but then also financing plans, plans for how it would work. Um, and once again, sort of in prototyping, or at least sort of demonstrating some of those uh, possibilities, we did uh, this thing called uh, light play. And actually, some of the architects, it was a result of a competition. I see here at the GSD um, getting their masters now. Um, but it was a good way to kind of demonstrate how we could connect the city again and also talk about the history and what was lost uh, in those neighborhoods. Uh, and then uh, another project we're working on, Syracuse is a uh, prisoner reentry uh, project which incorporates regular affordable housing with uh, housing for our reentry population. Many people coming out of prison don't have the same uh, access to housing that we do, either through laws or just through lack of economic opportunity. So it was a way to incorporate it. This was also a de design competition. Um, one of the firms was So Ill, Florian Eidenberg, who's also uh, teaching here, submitted, and hopefully that will get built. Um, so why am I here uh, at Harvard for the year? Um, these projects are really great, they're fun, um, they're complicated, I love complication, I love math, um, but Fortune Society's project here, which was <coughs> what we were replicating, it's also a prison reentry project that got built. Um, we were a pre-development lender when I was at Deutsche Bank, um, and it just takes a lot of partners to get these deals done. Um, and it takes forever. Uh, it takes 13 financing sources and lots of years of sweat and tears. Um, and so I was thinking to myself, well, what are the ways we could do this um, that aren't as complicated? Um, this is Northside Piers on the Williamsburg waterfront. Um, so we were a construction lender, part of a construction lending consortium in it. Um, so that's Brooklyn, uh, New York. And 
This one as well, um, 113 affordable housing units. Um, in order to get it done, there was a rezoning from manufacturing to residential. 25% um, affordable, 80, 75% unaffordable. Um, <laughs> if you have been following the news, um, this is a classic corridor, so to speak. So the affordable housing is here and the unaffordable housing is there. Um, and the developers got an inclusionary housing bonus, um, making the towers that much taller. Um, and then, you know, a whole mix of subsidies and um, <clears throat> other things that sort of went into the project um, that made it very complicated and also just said, you know, there's a tax abatement, not just for the affordable units, but also for the market rate, which I would say is about another 33 million um, over the course of its development. And then after 30 years, we're gonna have to do it over because the affordability period is 30 years. So after 30 years, this can go to market rate and we start the whole process over. So I love projects like this. I love the complications of them, but I just felt like there might be a better way to do this stuff. Um, and then of course the banks got uh, Community Reinvestment Act credit for the lending. So the, just this whole, I mean it's an ecosystem and it gets affordable housing done, but, and it needs to be done, but I think there are other ways you can do it. Um, and this is just a kind of outline of some of the issues. This is New York City, but just increasing median rents, loss of units, so we've lost about 400,000 units in that band of rents that are below $1,000. Um, and uh, rent burden has gone up, especially among seniors. Um, so project code name, De Design Your Affordability. I have the website. Uh, there's no content in it yet, but, um, <laughs> but you guys will help me with that. Um, so I started thinking about the projects I was doing but then how we actually live. So um, when I moved to New York, 300 square feet, six floor walk. 20, I mean, it was a lot of exercise, but I didn't need a gym membership. And it was at a 20% discount to the units on the lower floors, right? So I'm sort of finding my affordability um, through maybe a little bit of pain. They didn't call it micro unit back then, um, but it was. Um, the next place I lived, 2,400 square feet, um, illegal, seven-year commercial lease, um, no rent increases. So a kind of long-term way um, that was happening in Williamsburg at the time um, where one could rent an apartment and have the kind of stability of a commercial lease, um, but of course, it's illegal. Um, but it was a great place to live. Um, and then uh, the place I actually bought at $200 a square foot, when apartments were going for 600 and now $1,200 a square foot in the neighborhood was sold raw and each person built out their unit. So a very different process at work and how I lived at home. Um, so just thinking about some of these things, um, my current place, uh, a three-story walk-up that was a storefront and now a very compact apartment with two rental units above. Um, so I also just thought about growing up. Um, Rainer Bannon would, I think, call that the Plains of Id, the kind of part of Los Angeles that was built as affordable. Um, I mean, private developers built it, but they built you know, these things um, one after the other. 800 square feet, family of four. Um, moved, more expensive, but better schools. Right. So we have all these choices. In the buildings I showed you, like Northside Piers, um, the 113 units had 12,000 applications for its units. Um, David Ajay just finished his affordable housing development in Harlem, 50,000 applications for 100 or so units. So it's just the demand is so high that I feel like we need <coughs> new models. Um, you know, duplex apartment, um, the landlord basically took in the rent, that was his income. Um, so just thinking about ways of designing affordability like we do for ourselves. And how can we make that more legible? Um, so here, um, looking at the MIT uh, Media Lab, that's doing really interesting things. Um, New Avenue Homes in San Francisco and Oakland that is doing accessory dwelling units. Um, looking at ways of getting light into interior uh, layouts. Uh, 
In Syracuse, we built a live work home. This is Cook and Fox. Um, that thought, rethought about um, how the single family house could be affordable and flexible. Um, Larry Sass at MIT, basically printing houses. So there are lots of ways to do it. I also looked at international models. So um, just a very quick animation of uh, Semex, a big cement company working with in Mexico that had precast uh, concrete with formwork that could be moved and a uh, mobile concrete plant that basically moves down the street, can build one house a week uh, for about $20,000. In Rio, um, the way, if you own your house, you own the roof and you can sell it and people build above you. Um, so just thinking about all these ways of doing it and then thinking about how to finance it. Um, so thinking about foundations, uh, that 5% slice is nice, it's $46 billion a year or so. Um, but that other slice, um, which is their actual corpus, they have to spend 5% out a year to maintain their foundation status. Um, but the 900 or so billion here, um, I think we should look at to deploy for these kind of things. Um, and then just how uh, we look at funds and what they are, are they cash, are they guarantees, is it private equity? Um, so I leave you with four questions. What can we do in planning and design to create and enhance affordability? How can we package these innovations to be legible to lenders and regulatory agencies? How can we combine design innovation with financial tools <coughs> to scale and replicate? And what would a fund look like? Thank you. Good afternoon. I just want to start by saying how unbelievably grateful I am to be here and how lucky I feel to have this amazing cohort and the support uh, that I've already found here at Harvard. Um, I, my name is Jane Blossom. I help run the Santa Fe office for Atkin Ocean Shade Architects. And I also started the Sustainable Native Community <coughs> Collaborative. And instead of sort of run through sort of a, a, a broad body of work, I thought that it might be helpful if I maybe walked through more in depth with one very formative project to help provide a framework for what I hope to, to be asking this year and, and for your help in thinking through some of these things. So um, starting with uh, me being a student at Penn and of course learning about William Penn's plan for Philadelphia and how it was fundamentally based in his Quaker belief system. Um, I managed to somehow go straight from Philadelphia to Zuni Pueblo. Um, okay, I was chasing a boy. <laughs> and uh, what was so striking uh, to me is that, first of all, I hadn't learned anything at all about these Pueblo Indian settlements in school. And secondly, how uh, sort of amazingly intact some of these communities still are. Uh, and how they also were the indigenous planners and designers who very organically designed these places, really did it as well, based on a very strong belief system and how some of those systems are still in place today in forming modern life um, for, for these communities. I had the opportunity uh, to uh, become an Enterprise Rose Fellow in 2000, and if anyone here is interested in talking to me more about it, it's a fabulous opportunity placing emerging architects with community development organizations for three years, it's a, it's a working fellowship. And uh, it's, I, I managed to work with Ohiwenge Housing Authority just north of Santa Fe. And the, um, the image on the top left here is the Pueblo with the earliest known photograph, that's an 1877 photograph. You can see it's a, a very dense multifamily uh, communities situated around plazas that are their ceremonial plazas still to this day. They still do their feast day dances um, and, and two story. And this is uh, very much how it was about five years ago. A lot of the second stories are gone, but you still see 
the form of the plazas and the settlement patterns that we created by those um, indigenous planners and that it's also situated around, this is an agricultural valley and th this is an agricultural society. So really the, the question of form when I started working at OK Wenge was paramount because they were starting their first housing project. It had been the first time they had taken it on for themselves. And so the question of self-determination was big, and the question of form and what was appropriate here was very important. So we did, we did start out by looking at what the traditional architectural heritage of this community was, but uh, this was just a quarter mile away from the Pueblo Plaza area. And uh, this represents something that is a phenomenon across uh, Indian country that is a, is a, is a lovely relic of the 20th century and some federal policy about how housing got built. I just, I'm not gonna have time to go into much of the regulations, but so much federal policy and regulatory and, uh, um, information is how a lot of the communities have been shaped recently. And just as a tidbit, it wasn't until 90, uh, 1996 that any tribal member on a reservation could even obtain a mortgage. So just imagine in how many communities across the country just even missed the GI Bill. Um, like a lot of catching up to do. And so uh, we started working in a community design process with this project. Uh, it was gonna be a low income housing tax credit project. And uh, really starting to, to get some storytelling to understand what that appropriate form might be. And obviously we, we did base it on the historic Pueblo. We, heard a lot from the community, but it was difficult because the concept of density had already shifted from, from multifamily to single family. But we used this as a way to go back to the massing and orientation uh, of, of the uh, historic Pueblo. And 2005, I had already started to set up the uh, Santa Fe office with AOS Architects, and they have a lot of preservation background, so at that point, uh, Tomasita Duran and I, uh, the Executive Director of Housing Authority, started talking about uh, how we can really start looking at the historic Pueblo because of the disinvestment in the 20th century. So many of the Pueblo homes were in ruin or in very bad disrepair. And you can see it sort of runs the gamut from complete ruin to, to habitable. But out of the original 150 homes that we think were in this 700-year-old <coughs> place, only 60 still remained, and of that, only 25% were occupied. So here was their most sacred, um, vital place that had been largely um, abandoned except for feast days. Not having any money and not knowing where to start, uh, we did get a $7,500 grant to start a youth education project. Um, and now I kind of want to start every project with youth because it's so fun and they bring so much to it and they go home and they talk to their parents. We taught them surveying, we taught them GIS, um, and then we got another grant to do an oral history program. Uh, we, we recognized the storytelling that was so important to the original tax credit project uh, that really needed to be memorialized, and then the, uh, the kids could be the, the AV crew as well. And of course, the more we started to know about the project, the more we realized we didn't know that much. This is such an ancient place. There had been no documentation, no plats, no deeds. So it all became a matter of talking with the community members and trying to understand, piecing together some of the puzzle because we knew that eventually we would want to get some federal funding to try to, to, try to actually implement these ideas. We did a lot of mapping. Uh, I think we tried to map just about any condition possible we also worked quite a bit on material sciences, and this is where uh, the tribal councils uh, helped us quite a bit with establishing a cultural advisory team to talk about very culturally sensitive issues. Um, one of them is archaeology, but this one had to do with, again, what's appropriate, not just form, but materials here. And um, unfortunately, the tradition of mud plaster had, um, with everyone coming together in the community, had gone away with the agrarian economy going to a cash economy, right? Um, and also, in the, in, with new methods and materials, we have cement stucco that now encase the adobe and create a very, very uh, catastrophic condition in some cases. So talking with the cultural advisory team about what was appropriate became a huge um, 
conversation and that dialogue led to sort of this stopping point where we realized that what had emerged from all these conversations was the tribe's own preservation philosophy. And it kind of sometimes conflicted with what we had to do uh, being on the historic register to meet the Secretary of Interior standards. But what was brilliant and I think ultimately uh, the most powerful piece of this project is that the tribe decided to start a dialogue, decided to actually become partners with federal agencies and organizations that um, are usually thought of as just imposing restrictions or giving funding. So literally getting everyone at the table, we sat with the State Historic Preservation Office and HUD and the tribe and the Housing Authority and really worked on what the main goal of this project was and recognized that through dialogue, a lot of these you know, sort of standards that we assume can actually be flexible. Over almost half of the construction crew were tribal members, and we wrote that into the project. And some of them have gotten to be so excellent at adobe stabilization that they've even gone as far as the Presidio and worked on the adobe buildings there. And of course, that brings money into the community. And then, of course, if we don't go back to the sort of maintenance question, where are we going to be in 5, 10, 15 years? And so now, Tomasita at the Housing Authority makes it a requirement so that if you get a rehabilitated home, you take home ownership and mud plastering courses, which are very fun. I mean, everyone likes to play with, with mud. <laughs> so from 2005 to what we see today, we're now in phase four. We've, we've raised over $9 million, and we continue to raise money for the project. It's an infill project. It has to be. All the money that we've gotten so far have some federal origin that we've got 14 different funding sources in the pot. And um, you know we're looking for phase five to start up. But we've also managed to um, get some infrastructure money to bring all the utilities underground. So what we're seeing now is a lot more participation in the dances. We've seen revitalization of other buildings in the plazas, people realizing that they can inhabit this place again, that they can sort of retake it as their identity. And we're thrilled that we've gotten more attention I don't really, um, I don't think of architectural record as the place where you really start to um, talk about mud, but you know, it's, it's happening, it's a conversation. So you can imagine with this highly formative uh, project, now a 14 year relationship with a very strong community, okay, we gay, how, how do we talk about impact and scale? And I really liked the way that Kolu addressed that with a response to a question a few days ago about is it scale or is it impact? Are we really looking at doing breadth or depth if we do it really well in one community? I started the Sustainable Native Communities Collaborative because you know, in Indian country there is such a need for, for this kind of capacity. And we think of ourselves um, as architects, designers, planners, and we very much do the direct action on the ground. We're working with Make It Right right now um, in Fort Peck. But we also find the need to, to be thought leaders and to pull in other thought leaders and to be advocates um, to really connect the dots in a sense. And so one of the things that we see as a need is that you know you can pick up the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and, and hear very negative things about what's happening in Indian country or, or many marginalized communities, but you don't hear the success stories and we're seeing so many amazing, um, innovative projects happening that we wanted to document, and this is why we did the case studies. And um, we also wanted to provide lessons learned and best practices so that we use these as tools to say this community did it over here, maybe this can be applicable here. Because there's so much isolation in a lot of um, tribal, but even just rural America, not knowing what is available and possible. And because we also know that everyone learns differently, like Shahira, I'm really looking at learning from different media um, and, and really understanding how to tell the story to have the impact. So part of the case studies, we've developed some videos. and um, All of this is online. Uh, but it really helps to tell the story from the point of view of not just me up here at a podium, but really listening to how people in their own words are expressing what's going on in their community. Um, and so for, for this year, I think that, um, you know, I've, I've struggled a little bit with working in many different communities now and having kind of 
then the parachute consultant that comes in and sort of, you know, is treated as the expert. And I, and I think that's a tension that any of us that work in marginalized communities or any community that's not directly our own need to face and ask ourselves, who are we as the expert and what kind of advice um, can we really give and how do we engage the community to, to, to feel empowered that they have knowledge of their own. So that is something that I think is, um, is, is very important. I'd love to have a dialogue with any of you with, with whom that resonates, but what is our responsibility? What is our role as the planner, the architect, the outsider? Um, but also what I'm seeing is the need for systems thinking, and I'm actually thinking of myself as more of a planner these days than an architect, and I need this environment to sort of give me some tools to do that, because what's happening in our rural communities is that they're becoming more brittle, they're not as resilient as we'd like to see. And if our rural communities aren't resilient, then what does that mean for our urban communities? And I'd like to really provoke a dialogue about this because I see an urban bias in a lot of the research and the funding and the advocacy and uh, talking about the future all about cities, but I was so um, empowered and excited when Neil Brenner, like the second day I was here, was talking about what is urbanization. Um, for instance, we're seeing in, the, in North Dakota and Eastern Montana this crazy uh, natural gas boom and the effect that it's having on these communities. Um, and you know, the corporations are making a lot of money out of it and it's creating an environmental distress. It's also creating distress in the communities that have no governmental or regulatory means to actually address this kind of thing. And so when we think about all the systems that feed the urban environment, we, we do need to think about the rural. And, and, I, and I really think that we need to have more attention paid to that. Um, I'd also really like to, to talk and, and see some successful models of projects and processes, principles, and I'm hoping to actually have a convening in the spring uh, with some, some thought leaders around the country about uh, principles that, that we can address and maybe each community can begin to use on their own, but at least it's a starting point. And of course, one of the reasons this is a good time for me is that having an architectural practice and a burgeoning nonprofit at the same time is not necessarily sustainable for myself. <laughs> and so how, how do I balance all the things that I'd like to do? Um, how do I have that? that balance and what's the most important thing in terms of the impact. So appreciate all of your help this year in helping figure that out. Thank you. So good afternoon, and I'm gonna tell you a story about people and place, and so, as Mark shared with you, that if you think that this is a story about, is it that one, or? It's the side one. Side one. <laughs> <laughs> if you think this is a story about Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, you're wrong. This is really about Atlanta, and it's about this neighborhood that in which I live and work in today. So, let me give you a little bit of a history lesson, right? So, <clears throat> just to kind of orient you, this is the Pittsburgh neighborhood. It is not isolated off the beaten path. You can see that Interstate 75, 85 intersects as well as Interstate 20. We are less than 10 minutes from the Atlanta University Center, which houses the most historical black universities in our country, Morehouse College, Morehouse School of Medicine, Spelman, Morris Brown, Clark Atlanta. You can see we're less than five minutes from the state as well as State Capitol and City Hall. And what's really important is that we're just across the expressway from Turner Field, which was the former site for the Olympic Stadium. So a little bit of a history lesson. People asked us, how did we get this name called Pittsburgh? And so um, this is one of Atlanta's oldest historic neighborhoods, founded in 1883. Um, it was um, established by African-American laborers in the aftermath of the Civil War, Pittsburgh became affordable 
and, and, and a refuge for working class families that were fleeing the wrath of the Ku Klux Klan in counties south of Atlanta. And so the neighborhood was named Pittsburgh because the land, of the, the land south of the rail shops were so smoky and polluted that it resembled the steel mills of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the late 1800s. So despite this unhealthy environment, neighborhood continued to expand west of, of the rail line into what is known now as more of the heart of the neighborhood. Some um, kind of what we like to consider is that this is Carrie Still, and she opened the very first home for African Americans um, in the state of Georgia, um, first orphanage, I, I want to say. And so what was happening was families that were struggling were leaving their children um, on the um, in rail box cars, and she was working on the rail yard. She would take them home and feed them and later open up an orphanage. So this is a neighborhood that has a lot of rich history. The neighborhood really came together and decided that they needed to have a school called the Pittsburgh School. And so in 1908, they started the first public school for um, African Americans in this part of the, the city of Atlanta in one of the churches. They later then decided they needed a larger school. Fulton County School Board gave um, a whole whopping $75 for the construction of a new school in which the community raised the rest of the money to be able to do and named it after Mr. William H. Crockman, who was the first African-American to become president of Clark College at the time, which is now um, Clark Atlanta University. So there was this kind of, this real rich history, and then in the 1920s, Pittsburgh was the place to be. It was hustling, it was bustling, lots of shops, lots of stuff that happens, but as you know, the decline and the end of um, Jim Crow segregation and out migration led to a bunch of stuff that happened to a lot of neighborhoods across um, this country. And so um, the black businesses started to lose their customer base. Um, the 1960s brought in the construction of the interstate system that cut off the southeastern portion of the neighborhood. The failed model cities program, which is kind of what happened right here, which um, really tore down and displaced single family homes to build um, these multi-unit um, units, which became magnets for crime. In the 80s, we all know about the deregular, deregulatory policies that led to non-banking um, or non-banks lenders lending um, you know, these exotic loan products and predominantly in communities of color that lasted over 30 years. And then in 1994, Pittsburgh was included in the Atlanta Empowerment Zone. So kind of every federal program that helped or was supposed to help low-income neighborhoods, this neighborhood was designated for it, and still it was on this decline. And then Atlanta became um, the home of the 1996 Olympics. And I said again, we're just across the expressway, less than a five to 10 minute walk and so where Atlanta was celebrating being the home of the 1996 Olympics, this neighborhood did not benefit. Hint, hint to those people in Boston that are advocating for the Olympics. <laughs> Make it work for everybody. So um, out of this frustration, this really lack of kind of community organizing, residents came together and founded the Pittsburgh Community Improvement Association in 1999. And they were clear that they needed to have an organization that both impacted the civic infrastructure but community development in order to be able to kind of move this neighborhood forward. And one of their very first actions was they created and raised enough money to do the first redevelopment plan for the neighborhood. They raised about $200,000 and brought in people. And residents really rallied around this, right? And after this 300-page document was completed and was adopted by the city council in 2002, the residents felt the city had everything that they needed in order to make the neighborhood better. They really thought that their work was over, right? But what ended up happening was things didn't get better. The city adopted the plan there was no implementation plan, no implementation strategy. There was no money to make the plan, to have the plan to move forward. And really residents felt that they were almost duped in this instance because they raised the money to write a plan because that's what they were told and then realized that it sat on the shelf. So I moved into the neighborhood in 2003, but now this is my house just this year for you Bostonians. And you New Englanders that don't believe that it snows in Georgia. <laughs> we really had snow this year, but 
I moved and bought my first house in this neighborhood. And um, it was 13 months later when I really realized this organization even existed. I was a church administrator. I had just left um, working for the church and started consulting nonprofits around organizational governance. And so when I realized that this organization assisted, I was asked to come in and help them around some of their governance issues. And um, prior to that, I did some work in corporate America. But if you've ever worked in the church, then you know that it takes something to unite people around their faith, their church, and their money. <laughs> and so I took those skills and said, how do I help my neighborhood move forward? But I was real clear with them that I knew nothing about housing, I knew nothing about community development, and I clearly did not have a planning background. So six months, I came into the organization and reorganized it set it up because there was a bunch of programming that was going on but no clear direction, set up three major departments here um, <clears throat> and said, this is what I think that you're going to need in order to then now begin a search for an executive director. And so I committed to six months. Later then, after the six months, um, there were six more months and there are six more months and now I'm probably on my 15th rendition of my six month contract <laughs> and we are going into year 12 together. But one of the things that I realized was the neighborhood, um, and for some of you planners, sometimes the people who are angry in those meetings and that frustration that you, you hate to see that angry person really is trying to relate to you that there's something that's wrong in their neighborhood, but they don't necessarily know how to articulate that to you. And so one of the first things that I started to do was to get data and really take this data and figure out how do we use this data to really empower the residents so that they can start then articulating their issues back and really start to hold our elected officials um, more um, accountable. This is a neighborhood that has an area median income of $27,000 for a family of four. And so when they started to see um, development happening, it wasn't happening with them. So the other thing that I realized is there was so much focus around this negative um, elements that were happening in the neighborhood, they didn't really take time to really think about what were the positive assets that they had in the neighborhood. So here, we specifically did a map of just of the assets to remind the neighborhood residents that there was something that was still valuable about this place they called Pittsburgh, from the various churches till we have a beautiful park recreation center, um, both at the uh, west and the east portion, the Salvation Army, um, our office, and what I want you to kind of pay a little attention to is that this whole southern border of our neighborhood is the Atlanta Beltline, and I'll tell you about that in just a few minutes. So, residents were complaining about crime. It was something that I felt that was a rallying cry, because again, I didn't understand development. So we brought people together around how do we start working on crime. And so we created this manual that really just gave residents a resource tool to say, here's your issue, here's who you call in order to make this thing happen. And code enforcement was really, really bad in this neighborhood because, again, it was neglected for many, many years. People walked away from their properties. And so what we decided to do was I employed the residents to kind of go out into the neighborhood and survey. Let's find the worst 24 properties that we could find, give them to um, code enforcement so that we can start um, kind of taken down. So you can start seeing some of the development here. And then in 2006, I partnered with the Georgia Conservancy, which I got a lot of riff from some of my colleagues because they said CDCs do housing. We don't do the civic infrastructure work. We don't partner with organizations like this because these are tree huggers. And so we're trying to tear down stuff and build it, and they're trying to protect the environment. The two doesn't mix. But for me, being a non-housing person, I said, this is exactly what we need. We need more trees. We need more space. We need more green space. So this just wasn't happening in Atlanta, but you can see most of our children walk to school. And so even, even kind of what using this, the sewer separation project as an opportunity to get um, some of our sidewalks repaired. So this is the Atlanta Beltline. And it is the largest urban revitalization project in the US that spans about 22 miles across around the city that will construct light rail, homes, stores, parks, trails. It passes through 45 neighborhoods, some of the most poorest in the city of Atlanta. And because of the announcement of this Beltline coming on board, values in our neighborhood went from 80,000 to as high as $400,000 for single family housing. 
two years ago, like urban neighborhoods across all of America, Pittsburgh fell victim to this nation's foreclosure crisis. In fact, few places in the city of Atlanta, or in America for that matter, were as hard hit as the Pittsburgh neighborhood. This compact community of 1,800 properties experienced 866 foreclosure filings in the last 24 months. Foreclosure filings that drove old homeowners, new homeowners, and young renters from their homes and have left in this neighborhood an intolerable level of vacancy and blight. So while I was advocating to our local policy um, um, makers to say we need to be able to do something, this, raised, this was raised to a national profile. And so the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta featured my neighborhood in their third quarter edition in 2000 and eight, talking about the foreclosure issue here. And then that's when policymakers started to pay more attention. So I got really angry, and so I ran for city council. <laughs> and so I launched a campaign for city council to really start talking about these issues about comprehensive redevelopment and what should be happening. So of course I went door to door and I ran against a 16 year incumbent. But in the middle of running for that, I launched two campaigns simultaneously. I told residents that we needed to go through and document every parcel of land in the neighborhood. And because we needed to get as much public data because we realized for, um, the foreclosures were result a lot to mortgage fraud and other issues. And how do we start making sure that we were prepared for some of this federal recovery dollars that were coming down the, line, uh, down the pipeline called Neighborhood Stabilization Program? So with that, we um, took pictures of houses. We found all the public data. And so in 2009, because of this work that we did, we were positioned for the first time to get the largest allocation of $2 million to start buying homes that were foreclosed in the neighborhood. So it was the very first for the neighborhood, right? So for us, it was a huge win. We acquired 31 homes. And then some of those same colleagues that were laughing at me decided to elect me as their president of the Atlanta Housing Association of Neighborhood-Based Developers. I lost the election, but they, they thought that my message around comprehensive development was very different and very different model on how CDCs usually did their work. Um, to date right now, we um, have completed phase one and two of our, our pilot and five pilot phase, phase two, one, and we're in the midst of working on phase two and a model street kind of concept because we realized that people can't kind of imagine themselves, so we're able to complete both sides of the block and then show what this neighborhood can look like, we think that we can get greater investment and really start selling homes there. And so these are some of the homes that we've been able to complete, both kind of new construction, preserving some of our older homes that's there. And so my fellowship year would really consist around these three areas, kind of you know closing my, my learning gap around real estate and financing and, and thinking about what good public policies should be. Um, really kind of the advancement of sustainability. I want to learn more about kind of these evolving constructing sta construction standards and building practices and how do we kind of minimize the negative environment and what are the health impacts of some of this. And then last but not, not least, um, around race, class, equity in the South. I mean, how do you create an infrastructure that allow organizations and faith institutions individuals kind of coalesce and come together to establish um, systems that really affect their social, political, economic, health, faith, and natural environments. And so that's how I plan on spending my fellowship year. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Gisli, I'm from Reykjavik, Iceland. Really happy to be here, an amazing honor to be selected as the, one of the Loeb Fellows. 
there's a complete coincidence that I even knew of this fellowship. I will mention that later. Uh, it's connected to Reykjavik, the reason why I know about the Low Fellowship, but I'm apparently the first Icelander to, to do this amazing thing, which is called the Low Fellowship, and I'm really honored and glad that I'm, I was the one that was chosen. So, I come from Iceland. Iceland is the, uh, the island way up there. It's not as small as many people think. It's bigger than Denmark and Ireland and <laughs> Scotland and some other uh, nations that you might not think of as big, but they are, they are sort of our big brothers and sisters, although our island is bigger, but we are very few. You might have heard about Iceland in the last few days because we have this going on, a volcanic eruption, <laughs> right where this is. This was on the front page of the Washington Post yesterday. And uh, this actually is a time-lapse video that shows you the lava crawling into a glacial river. So this is landscape architecture at work there. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, and it's actually, it's, it's amazing how much lava the earth produces when it starts to erupt. So you can see here, if this would have been in Manhattan, this is the, uh, the area that would be covered by lava. Uh, by now, so wow. it's uh, it's quite amazing stuff. But uh, this is far from Reykjavik. I live in Reykjavik, and that's my my area where I work. This is actually a cartoon that was done uh, on my birthday. Actually, this is a cartoonist, and it says uh, we don't serve children. And I'm saying, but I'm a safety counselor. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was quite young when I entered first TV, and then. Um, than uh, politics, and I'm just going to go through a little bit who I am. Uh, I, my background is political science. I'm drunk in this picture, as I understand <laughs> people should be when you're doing their undergraduate. Uh, then I went to Tübingen in Germany and lived there for a year and was very serious. And uh, after that, I was a flight attendant. <laughs> This isn't me, but it could have been me if things would have gotten worse. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm skilled to be a flight attendant. So please remember that your nearest exit could be behind you. <laughs> uh, then I went to the uh, University of Edinburgh and uh, I had gained interest in the city and what makes cities good and bad. So I. I did a one-year master's degree in the University of Edinburgh that's just called the city. It's an inter interdisciplinary course. It was amazing. I did some planning and I did some uh, architecture, actually, architectural theory and history. And uh, that was sort of an eye-opener for me. Uh, I had been uh, quite a big advocate of, uh, of bicycles uh, in Reykjavik. We had a horrible bicycle infrastructure for years, but I I always biked a lot and I made a point of biking without helmet and in my suit. Uh, I also fought for uh, equal pay. This is me. Uh, <laughs> uh, this was to show people, I mean, if, if I was a woman, I would be get uh, less paid than I'm doing now, just because I would be a lady. Uh, so I'm, I was a TV uh, news reporter for years and a talk show host after that, and they were kind enough to to give me awards and I was very happy and then I went into politics. And I stayed actually happy when I was in politics, but uh, so this is me casting a vote for myself. <laughs> then last October I quit doing that and I started doing TV again. And I will sort of discuss why I did that. This is a TV show that I did from last October until I came here. It was called Sunday Morning. It was a current affairs show every Sunday morning, like 90 minutes show. Um, I interviewed all the, I mean, this is the prime minister here. It was a really big interview that he, uh, yeah, it didn't go well for him, I think. And <laughs> the cartoonists had a field day. And the guy up in the right corner is actually has, a, has an exhibition now at the uh, Institute of Contemporary Arts down in Boston. Uh, Ragnar, he's called, the show is called Visitors, and it's fantastic. Okay. So yeah, I can't show you anything from my, my show, but Mark suggested that I would show you this. This is a, like a teaser for my TV show. It's ridiculous, but I, it's only 20 seconds. Uh, so because you wouldn't understand anything, but you might, I mean, this is just pictures. So this is the show I was doing before I came here. Sorry about this. 
So, uh, this is the city hall in Reykjavik, and I started doing city politics in 2002, and I quit, like I said, last October. I was mainly in planning, transportation, and environment issue. I was also on the board of the public transportation for the metropolitan area, and I was also on the board for parking in Reykjavik, which I think is a remarkable uh, tool to use to make your city better. And uh, I was on the committee that did the new master plan for the city. Okay, Reykjavik is a fantastic place to, to live in. Uh, as I said, the island is not very, uh, it's not particularly small, but we are very few. We started as only six inhabitants in the year 1874, plus minus two years. We are pretty accurate about this. We know when, when Ingolver came and he had killed his wife. And then not much happened uh, until 1800, 600 people had been there. Uh, it was still a city, it was by far the largest city in Iceland. In, in 1900 there were 6,000 and now we are 120,000. My favorite stat about Iceland is that uh, we have the most Nobel Prize winners per capita of any country in the world. <laughs> One. <laughs> but being so few it's easy to be kings of the world per capita. Okay. Uh, this was Reykjavik in 1947, and funnily enough, it's not dissimilar from what Lachon was talking about, how, how the cities deteriorated uh, during the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, so we were there, it's quite compact, you could walk everywhere, it's a fantastic little city to live in, uh, but then things started to, to go uh, the wrong way, and during the next 60 years, we basically only built here, in the, uh, in the outskirts. And uh, which was a shame because all of a sudden you couldn't walk anymore and everyone went everywhere uh, on, in a car. Uh, not good at all and this was the things that me and other people start, started to realize uh, how we were destroying our fantastic city. So this is one of the, one of the, uh, uh, one of the things that happened after this. I mean, this area has 62,000 people, could have much more. One of the reasons is the airport that is down there. This, this is the domestic airport. It's you know within five minutes walk from the city center. Ridiculous uh, space to have an airport on, but the Brits came in in 1940 and built an airport wherever they liked. And they actually removed houses that were there. Me and other people have been fighting to get rid of this airport and build there rather than building in the outskirts. So more densification. And this airport is actually the reason why I'm here, because we had this big international uh, planning competition about if we should take the airport away and what should be replacing it. And one of the, of the uh, main fellows on the jury was Juan Busquets, who was a professor of uh, planning here at the GSD. So he told me about this uh, fellowship. He actually talked to Jim. I don't know if Jim remembers this. This is back in 2006. And I always thought, wow, what a fantastic opportunity. And now when I, when I quit doing politics, I immediately decided that I would apply for this fellowship. So 62,000 people in this area is way too few. Those are the cities we like to compare ourselves to. And this is the exact same area. You know, it's all taken from Google Maps. So it's the same size uh, uh, in those uh, cities, Copenhagen, Edinburgh, Stockholm, and Helsinki. Only Helsinki is about the same uh, population in this area, but they are building here, as Maria has told us, uh, and they are really working strongly in trying to get more people into this picture. And you see Stockholm with 300,000 people only there. We had 60,000 people. So, we like like the per capita records. This record is not good. We have we have the world record in cars per capita, and it's not because of the weather or anything. It's because of bad decision making by us, the politicians. And this grew enormously. And the reason was not that Iceland loves cars more than others. It's because we planned the city poorly. So uh, this is comparison to other cities in Europe. And it used, I mean, even in 95, we were at this level. So things have been going very wrong. Uh, almost no one bike. This is 2001. There is a column there in, in red. You can hardly see it. I can zoom in, and you can see this is, this is under 1% of trips made were made by bicycles. <laughs> so we had this, but lost it to this. 
and this was true all over the all over the city. This uh, was going on all around the city as well. Uh, and the first people to notice this were actually artists and comedians and cartoonists. And this says, well, now we only need to find parking lot. Uh, I mean, uh, and we, you know, group of young people wanted to change this, and we decided to run for office or do something about this. The turnaround sort of came with the green steps that, that Mark mentioned. We took a holistic approach, so we thought, okay, let's make the city better and more dense, but let's also take a whole green approach to the whole thing, recycling uh, more environmentally friendly cars, so they got free parking. We decided to put in loads of bicycle lanes. We decided to make a new master plan for the city. The big master plan from 62 had got, gotten us into all this trouble. So we wanted to, to uh, throw that out and bring in some new with new thoughts. And rather than having 90% of everything that's being built, being built outside the current urban area, we decided to turn it completely around. So in this new master plan, we have 90% of every house that's being built within the city limits as it is now. Uh, and these are the areas that we are building. The uh, the uh, the orange ones are is the uh, the infill projects. The blue ones is landfill. Uh, we're not fond of that anymore, but there are two projects like that. But mainly, it's in you know on brownfields in old industrial areas. So instead of this, we will get this. This is a rendering. But instead of this, we have already gotten this. It's very much about transportation for us. It's about putting in bike lanes. It's about uh, putting houses where there was nothing. And it's, it's been, we've been doing this at an amazing speed actually in the last few years. We also wanted to inform and educate the general public. This is a famous picture that was taken in Münster, Germany. It shows the space that the car and the bus and the bikes take up. We decided to make our own version. This is actually done in my street back at home and what was, was, was striking was standing here on, in this picture when we were doing the car picture and the noise and the pollution was so so striking compared to the to the bikes and the bus. Uh, we did a new master plan for bikes bicycles. Uh, we, we mapped out where bicycle lanes should be. We did uh, bicycle super highways from the uh, suburbs and down to the city center and in the city center we did a really dense network of, of bike lanes, you can see that here. Uh, the big project were two amazing uh, bicycle super highways where there were planned, uh, they had already planned automobile highways but uh, they weren't realized and we put in bike lanes instead and the, the auto high lane, high, highway will never be realized. So it looks like this. It's much easier to do a bicycle lane where no one lives, like in the outskirts. It's much more difficult to do it in an urban area where it's only limited space, but we did that as well, and we actually used similar methods to what Andrew describes in Team Better Block. We just took out the parking spaces and painted it green, and said, let's try, let's see what get, comes out of this. And then we learned from our mistakes, and we learned what, what uh, was going well, and this is actually when we were doing the bike lanes uh, uh, you know, not temporarily, but permanently, and we put in some, it's, I mean, in the city center, we heat up our, our, our sidewalks and our bike lanes. So this is actually pipes where hot water will come from the houses after it's gone through the radiators, and it heats up the bicycle lanes downtown, wow. which is quite good. So this is me bicycling on a part of the street that's already, that's already been done, uh, and it's really nice, and we are up to here now. So you can see this is before and after a classic picture. And as soon as we did this, uh, this, uh, the, those bike lanes and the, the sideways sidewalks, uh, business started coming in. And it happens, you know, in a matter of weeks. It was amazing how 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 this U-turn uh, happened. So it was loads of projects all over the city. We built big bridges only for pedestrian and bicycles, and we made a point of having them kind of striking in their in their design. Uh, somewhere we just had to put in some temporary stuff uh, and we put in bicycle uh, counter and stuff like that. So, dedicated bike lanes used to be like only, you know, a couple of hundred of meters, but now it's uh, like multiplied. Uh, we are counting the bicyclists, uh, the cyclists, and we more than doubled that. Actually, if you do take this Gallup poll, that city-wide poll with many hundreds of people that answer how they made the last trip, you can see that this has 
we have grown 10 times like Mark said, and we are thriving less as well. Some people ask me, did the uh, financial crisis have anything to do with this? The Geyser economy, or Geyser economy. Uh, well, we thought we were the richest country in the world in 2007, and then became poster child for the crash in 2008. Uh, we started all of this before the crash. We probably would not have been able to start this, uh, but we, we could do it because the mayor, who was not very much into this, he sort of thought, yeah, I, I have enough money. I can give this, this uh, you know, couple of uh, million dollars to Gisli uh, for this bicycle lanes, although he wasn't interested in it because we were rich. Then when the crash came, it was ridiculous not to keep on doing this because suddenly it was, uh, it was expensive to drive a car. So also after the crash, we had an election. And some countries in Europe, like Greece, had uh, you know fascists or really you know strong uh, right-wing parties coming in that were had, have, had really dangerous ideas. We got the comedians in, and this guy actually <laughs> is called Jon Gnar, and he has a book out that is called uh, Gnar: How I Became the Mayor of a Large City in Iceland and Changed the World. <laughs> and in the middle there he says, yes we can, and I did. And it's him and Lady Gaga down there, and him in a drag here for the gay pride walk. And they came in and they sort of had a different attitude. They weren't politicians at all, they were just artists. And they said, we don't know anything about to run a city, but we're trying to do it honestly, and we're trying to do it, you know, with collaboration with everyone, and they want everyone to, to work with them. And he actually said, I won't work with anyone unless he has watched The Wire. <laughs> because The Wire will teach you about politics. So, I, it, I mean, he wasn't in my party, but I, I was so fond of him, and I thought he did a great job as a, as a mayor for four years, and then he just left because he said the best party is a surprise party. <laughs> and the surprise is out of it, so I'm leaving. So this is the master plan, and I think oh it, will, it will change uh, the future of Reykjavik, and I think it will be enormously uh, massive plan that will have impact for decades to come. Sorry, Mark. This actually is the plan. It's here if someone wants to take a look. I'll leave it here. And uh, yeah, so we will, we will have a bright future, I think, in Reykjavik. And this is actually our goals in terms of transportation. Car from 75 down to 58, bus up from 21 up to 30% of trips made, and bicycles from 4% to 12% of all trips made. So this is me, you can contact me if you, if you want to know anything. I, I'm gonna pursue this, I'm gonna, during my, my low fellowship year, I wanna study how to do big projects like this better. I feel that even though we managed to do this, it was sort of a kamikaze method we used. We could have started earlier, started you know, getting the people uh, on board because people were really supportive of, of what we were doing, but we could have informed them better from the get-go mainly because then the, uh, the doubters and the haters and the, uh, the ones who were you know, working for the lobbyists and you know, uh, interest groups and stuff like that that didn't want any of this, they would have been kept quiet if all the public would have been more vocal with us. So I'm gonna see how to do that better and learn from good and bad things in this. Thank you very much. for the audience. Is, these were great presentations, you guys. And um, ordinarily, we would have Q&A, but this room is actually reserved from 2 o'clock on, and we have almost used up all our time. So I think I'm going to take the two remaining minutes, rather than asking for questions for the audience, to invite interested audience members to approach these um, four fellows and others you might recognize in the audience, and to maybe try to catch a conversation out in the Gallery. I'm very sorry, you guys. I wish we had time for Q&A, but I think we need to wrap up. So thank you all for coming. Yeah.